Okay, welcome, and uh, today's uh, lecture is going to be on uh, artificial intelligence and philosophy. And um, there are a number of uh, sort of pathways through this topic. It's incredibly complex, and um, this is not an attempt to be encyclopedic, um, nor am I trying to show sort of the only uh, interesting philosophical pathway through this material, but rather give you the general highlights of the terrain, you know, the general landscape, and also, I think, um, particularly near the end, offer some unique forms of criticism, uh, at least points to consider regarding the, um, the development um, and the ascent of uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, and its various forms, whether it be, you know, in mainframe desktop computing, um, in social robots, in um, you know driverless cars, you know I think there's a number of very interesting issues here. I'm not going to do much with ethics, but really focus a bit more on issues in the philosophy of mind. So um, one place to start, I, sus I suspect, is uh, to just try to get a little more clear on the types of artificial intelligence. And uh, here, you know, we can see that there are a number of ideals. AI has certainly achieved um, phenomenal success, more than we had expected, I think, by the, you know, when, once this got started. Uh, but there are still um, many forms of AI that are aspirational. And so if we look at the ideals of AI, you'll find roughly three categories. One is analytical artificial intelligence, which is cognitive problem solving only. Um, and this is not an attempt to make uh, a human-like intelligence, just something that allows us to navigate through space better. This is the kind of thing that Google Maps does really well when you're in a strange town and you're trying to get to the Italian restaurant or whatever it is. You basically navigate through this sort of analytical um, problem solving. Now, that could get increasingly sophisticated and there are many people working on that, but that's a bit different from the other ideal, which is a human-inspired um, artificial intelligence. And here, the idea is that not just cognitive um, problem solving, but also one is trying to achieve emotionality, uh, affective abilities or emotions within um, artificial intelligence. Uh, social problem solving, can AI navigate the social space? Can it read what another person is um, feeling and respond accordingly? Obviously, this is a much more sophisticated and difficult thing to achieve, and we haven't achieved anything like this. Um, thirdly, you know, the, the full-on AI, which is a kind of um, humanized artificial intelligence, which would be all the above, namely all the analytical skills and even some of these sort of socio-emotional skills, plus the idea that the AI would have self-consciousness. So this is sort of the last step that we think could be achievable. Some people think this is not attainable even, you know, it's not just a difficult practical problem in AI, but it, it might be um, impossible in principle. That's a debatable question. Uh, in any case, you can see why a robot or an AI that is also aware of itself uh, as an individual is a very high level of uh, intelligence and uh, consciousness. So one way of thinking about this also is in terms of weak AI versus strong AI. Uh, it's very common to think of uh, weak AI is, be, is a kind of specialized problem solving ability. This is the kind of pre-programmed um, AI that we're already living with to a large extent and you know as I said before, in a Google map situation where you're trying to get from point A to point B, the parameters of that solution are very uh, set and the AI simply has to calculate where you are in relation to the, the, the stated or objective goal and basically it, it has a sort of very mechanical, well in this case digital, you know, process of ones and zeros uh, with sort of gated pathways of information such that you end up uh, with the solution you want. Now, very simple cases are, have been with us for a long time, but now, of course, we're also getting very sophisticated chess-playing computers like Deep Blue, 
Um, and of course, um, what looks like uh, general intelligence, but is still really just specialized problem solving in the form of um, Watson, which is IBM's um, uh, AI um, candidate. And, you know, Watson can do pr phenomenal problem solving in a situation like Jeopardy, where it doesn't know the, the questions and it, it doesn't have, obviously, life experience, but it's able to crunch incredible amounts of data and, and give them as responses to formulaic uh, questions that it does, it has seen many, many prototypes. And so it has had a lot of learning and it has been able to do very well in um, sophisticated problem solving like the game of Jeopardy. The holy grail, I think, of AI is called strong AI, and this is the attempt to achieve general intelligence. This is adaptive emergent problem solving, artificial general intelligence, or AGI. Now, at this point, we don't have anything that does this. And uh, I think there's some confusion in the larger population about this because I think most people think that uh, Watson and maybe some of the self-driving cars have general intelligence. But in fact, what they have is just very elaborate, specialized problem solving stacked in hierarchical rules that allows them to toggle between these different uh, preset programs. And it can do it so fast and at such high levels of complexity that it looks like general intelligence. But Computers cannot solve totally novel problems that they haven't seen before in the way that human adults can. And so this is something that everyone's working towards, and some people think we shouldn't be working towards this. Uh, very famously, I think Elon Musk and uh, Stephen Hawking have suggested we shouldn't really be trying to achieve general intelligence, by which they, they're thinking of a really... Um, uh, a machine that can solve totally novel problems and that probably also has uh, self-consciousness. But these two are not necessarily connected. All right, um, <coughs> excuse me. So that's a good way to just begin uh, to make a foray into this um, problem or this set of challenges. Now let's take a look at what the, some traditional approaches to mind have been. Because if you're gonna try to understand what artificial intelligence is and what its potential is, we need to understand what just regular old intelligence is. And here we've had uh, a number of traditions, uh, some in philosophy, some in psychology, some in cognitive science, and it's worth just mentioning these up front so then we can track them as we go through. In philosophies, uh, philosophy has been thinking of the mind for a very long time, really ever since the days of Plato, as a representational system. We are able with our mind's eye, we even use this language, of getting a sort of representation of a state of affairs in this internal mental state, and then we can organize our behavior and our thinking toward that representation. So a very simple example would be, you know, picture your, uh, picture your home right now. I mean, uh, or maybe that's not good if you're sitting at home, picture your school or picture your, your car or your parents' home or, or you know, your child's favorite toy. Something that is not clearly present to immediate perception. Nonetheless, you can call it up as a memory. You can get the image in your mind. And to that extent, all human beings have this power of being able to represent reality. What that means is that um, when we try to figure out how to get from here to you know, downtown, we are able to use these representations and then place ourselves in relation to them and form a plan and then follow out that plan. So originally when people were designing robots and AI, they thought, well, we have to figure out a way in which the robot and the, or, or the AI um, can create a representation of the room that it needs to navigate through. And so that was a common way of thinking about the mind. Now, an alternative way of thinking about the mind comes out of psychology, and, and I think most people are familiar with the tradition that comes from Skinner of behaviorism, which is stuff that looks very intelligent, like it's a representational mind, oftentimes is just a kind of dumb conditioning 
where in a Pavlovian way, you know, you ring the dinner bell and the dog salivates uh, because the food is being brought. Eventually, you can just ring the dinner bell and the dog will salivate even when the food is not present because you've conditioned the animal's sort of gustatory uh, salivation response to the ringing of the bell by pairing it over and over again with food. And it turns out that a lot of sophisticated stuff that looks very intelligent is in fact oftentimes just the result of this uh, much more simple conditioning process. And um, that's another way of thinking about the mind, not as an internal form of representational system, but rather more like um, input, uh, as Skinner sort of talked about it, he didn't really know how this worked at that time, so he called it a sort of black box, but you get an input of, of stimulus and then you get a behavioral response. And essentially the mind then is, is not really inside very interesting to the point of view of behaviorism. The question was what actually leads to new and adaptive behaviors and how do we learn? So conditioning is a form of learning. Thirdly here I've got this sort of idea of algorithmic neural net uh, models and we'll talk more about this in a little bit but this is the idea that your your mind is made up of a lot of little sort of modules of problem solving and uh, what happens is in the same way that the you know behavior gets conditioned uh, the mind is made up of a bunch of little switches and if you flip the switches right then you get a kind of behavioral or problem sort of solving output and we now understand these uh, to be um, oftentimes unconscious but they just have a kind of sequential uh, system and this works very well once we got to a digital notion of mind where we could map the mind as a kind of binary system of ones and zeros and so logicians in the early 20th century, um, coming out of uh, the sort of positivist tradition, had a kind of Boolean algebra. And they said, well, if you think about the mind as a set of propositions, you can break those propositions down into these little smaller kinds of algorithmic relationships. And once we understand that, then all we have to do is enter the right inputs, and we get a sort of chain of events uh, which leads to through, through these binary algorithmic processes to a kind of behavioral or a cognitive output. And this view has obviously become the dominant view in cognitive science and the computational sort of revolution that occurred in the middle of the 20th century really lent great credence to this view. It gave the main metaphor for, for pursuing it, but it also was extremely, um, it, it was in a sort of feedback of corroboration because computation ended up uh, doing very well as a science and we were able to solve really large data problems using this way of algorithmic thinking. So we thought, well, the mind must work that like that as well. And in the early days of neuroscience, it seemed to corroborate this because the synapse has to fire. Um, and once it reaches a kind of action potential, it's almost like you get an on switch and uh, so you can think about the brain itself as being a digital system, and this was fairly common. Um, and then um, another way of thinking uh, about the mind is to think that these sort of modules of problem solving that make up the mind uh, are basically the product of evolutionary selection, natural selection. So we um, have been evolving as a, not humans have been evolving for, you know, Homo sapiens goes back to between 200 and 300,000 years in terms of anatomical modernity. Um, but of course, uh, uh, Homo erectus goes back, you know, two million years roughly, and Australopithecus back four to five million years ago. And so the argument is the mind all that time was evolving to solve particular problems on the African savanna. And so our minds are sort of descended from those smaller problem-solving mechanisms. And if you break down our modern mind, inside it you'll find these much older problem-solving mechanisms. Like you have, a, you have a kind of program or a script, the argument is, for, for uh, learning language. You have a program or a script for finding a mate and procreating. 
And so the mind could be broken down into like a finite set, um, albeit a long list, but a finite set of these modules. Lastly, on the bottom of those list and separated from this dotted line, I've included this idea of an affective approach. This approach to the mind is one that has not been uh, taken very seriously, but it's one that uh, myself and my colleague, uh, Dr. Rami Gabriel, have been sort of arguing for for the last few years. And our book uh, has just come out with Harvard University Press, uh, arguing that the mind should be understood uh, primarily as, a, as an emotional system or set of systems. And then some of these other traditions that I've listed here are built on top of the emotional mind. And so our book, The Emotional Mind, um, is a sort of systematic argument for this case. I'm not going to go into that really in this presentation, but I want you to understand that that's an option that doesn't get explored very much. And I think uh, we're just now starting to introduce it into discussions of AI, and hopefully that will continue to pick up uh, speed. All right. What are some alternative approaches to the mind? And so the ones I just laid out are sort of standard. And uh, there has been another tradition or way of thinking about the mind in uh, philosophy and in psychology. And I'm just gonna mention these, uh, sort of put a pin in these. And these are things we could come back to or that you should pursue on your own for further research. But pragmatism has always had a different view of the mind than the sort of representational model that's been dominant in philosophy. Pragmatism said, no, nah, the mind is not really just a mirror of nature where it just sort of creates a copy and then manipulates like this model in the head. Instead, the mind is more like um, an embodied way of solving practical problems. Like you have to navigate through space, you have to find food, you have to find a mate. These are practical problems, not theoretical problems. So the pragmatists like uh, Peirce, James, John Dewey, they focused more on what might be called practical reason and its fallible, ever-adaptive, responsive nature. Uh, we have an ability as human beings in particular to solve problems we've never seen before, and that's because we're able we're in a relationship with experience such that we can take bits of experience, try them out, see what's working, what's failing, and then rebuild uh, our, our suite of responses based on that experience. Now, we, we know that kind of view is valid and works in the sciences. It's basically the hypothetical deductive model of experimentation. But people like Dewey said, actually, the mind has been doing that in a simpler form since its origin. That's why we're so uh, successful as a species, is that we're able to apply this sort of um, test and response approach to life. But they're not abstract theoretical problems. Uh, those came along much later as science developed. Most of our problems are, again, related to our day-to-day, -day, everyday experience. Uh, French philosopher Merleau Ponty or German philosopher um, Martin Heidegger also talked about the mind not as just a spectator or a mirror of nature, but as the kind of thing that's immersed in various projects. So in many ways, you're, you're, you're not looking at the world to describe it uh, beautifully or accurately. You're actually just trying to get some project achieved or completed. So the analogy they give frequently is like you're engaged in tool use. Let's say you're using a rock to break open seeds at, or nuts and then get the sort of meat inside the, you know, the hard casing. Uh, in a sense, that's also a kind of intelligence. The rock becomes an extension of your arm or in the example of a modern tool, the hammer becomes an extension of your arm. And it's only when the hammer breaks or the stone tool cracks in half that you start to see it as an object for contemplation um, or an object in itself. Otherwise, it's, the world is really just connected to us as we solve various practical problems. Now, this is a very sophisticated view of the mind, and you can see that this view of the mind is going to be much harder to recreate as an artificial intelligence or, or robotic system. It's harder to sort of even articulate this notion of mind. 
Um, philosopher Hubert Dreyfus talks about the mind as a form of skillful coping. So you can see this in the art artist or the craftsperson who's working with materials, and they're engaged in slight modifications of their problem-solving behavior as they respond to the subtle differences of the material. So you'll see a woodworker, somebody who works with their hands and builds furniture, or somebody who creates pottery, or somebody who paints, um, or even engineers, they're not sort of modeling the world as a copy or a mirror. They're sort of in, in the thick of it, down in the mud, so to speak, with the material. And the way that they're using intelligence and thinking is this very um, adaptive improvisational uh, method. Um, and the way in which maybe all of this can be um, uh, sort of codified or at least summarized is in a relatively recent way of thinking about cognition, sometimes called 4E cognition, which is to say embodied, embedded, inactive, and extended cognition. And we won't spend too much time on this, but it's the idea that the mind is not just a kind of floating subjective consciousness in the, in the head um, mirroring the world. Rather, it is in the body. The body is constitutive or plays a role in what we're thinking and how we're thinking. It's embedded in a family, in a social world, in a geological, geographic, you know, social context. It's inactive because, as I said before, it's always involved in solving problems. You're trying to get through school. You're trying to find a mate. You're trying to build a better bridge across this river. Um, and it's extended. Um, the mind is not in your head. It's distributed through your, not just in your body, but also through your environment. So, you know, obviously tools are, are kind of extended mind. Symbols are a kind of extended mind. Our iPhones are extended mind. And finally, here I mention the affective approach is, is one of these alternative approaches to consciousness. Now, let's look at uh, an interesting uh, thought experiment, which is if you could keep building elaborate computers and AI, when would you actually achieve a conscious um, entity? When would we know if we had built something that was complex enough that it, it had consciousness or that it knew itself or that it could even solve problems in this general, uh, this general intelligence way I've been talking about? And the answer is uh, Alan Turing devised this thought experiment, quite famous, and many of you have heard of it, called the Turing test. And in it he said, okay, imagine you're you know, on a computer console uh, typing and having a conversation, but you, you can't see who you're having a conversation with. Now, in the other room, you've got two options. One is another person at a computer console, and they're basically chatting with you, just like an, an email or a live chat situation, and it's two humans talking to each other. The other option, however, is that it's a computer AI, and it's basically been programmed to respond to uh, conversational or linguistic prompts with conversational responses and also to initiate prompts and it's also possibly talking to you. Now you are assigned to one of these randomly and you don't know which one. So uh, the test is that a lot of people are doing this uh, and they've done this test at various places like uh, I know there's a there's a yearly Turing test at MIT and I think there's one at uh, Cambridge in any case, imagine you're just one person having this conversation. You don't know if it's a person or if it's an AI computer. Now they, you ask it, uh, hey, how are you doing? Or what's the weather like? What's new with you? What do you think about um, what the president's up to? And you're having a conversation. What Turing said was, um, if you have a half an hour conversation um, and you can't tell if it's a human being or, or a uh, or a computer, uh, in other words, if you can't tell it's not a, a human being, then uh, he thinks that that computer, if it was a computer, has passed the Turing test. Uh, let's say you are randomly assigned the computer, you don't know it, 
and you've been talking to this person for half an hour and, and they ask you at the end, well, are you talking to a person or a computer? And you say, this has got to be a person because the subtlety of their responses, the cleverness, the humor, the sense of um, deprecation, self-deprecation, the irony, like all of these sort of natural human qualities are coming through in the conversation. Then Turing says, you basically, we have to admit this machine into the consciousness club because the only criteria we have for knowing whether something out there is subjectively conscious is conversation. And it has passed the conversation test. Now, some people said this test is not good enough and other people think computers have already passed this test. But it's nonetheless a, a wonderful example of how we might try to assess whether something has general intelligence. A much uh, simpler test in some ways, but more complex in other ways, is Steve Wozniak's uh, coffee test of AI general intelligence. And this is the one that I actually prefer. <laughs> I like this much more. Um, if you're using the Turing test, you can see that it fits well with the kind of the view of intelligence that is bound or tethered to propositional sophistication or linguistic sophistication. So if you look at those traditional views of mind that I was talking about, they tended towards um, propositional sophistication or the kind of problem solving involved like in chess playing and the kind of thing that Watson is really good at, let's say, the IBM artificial intelligence uh, um, uh, model. But what I like about Wozniak's example here of the coffee test is it's much more like the embodied uh, alternative views of mind, which is that really what we mean by intelligence is not just stuff in your head, but um, operating in space and time and solving real problems in space and time. And so Woz Wozniak says, well, I'll be impressed when an AI robot can enter you know, the average kitchen and without pre-programming, solve all the little problems involved to make a cup of coffee. So if you took a very smart AI that had never, you know, made coffee before and you, you need, you give it a body, basically it's in a robot. Um, it is the robot. This is sort of an interesting distinction. You don't want to think about intelligence as just in a body, but it is also of a body. And you say to that robot, okay, um, go into this room that you've never been in before and make coffee, which you've never done before. Now, that turns out to be way more uh, difficult than it might seem on the face of it because the robot has to find um, the cups and understand how to boil water and um, understand how to filter the coffee and uh, do all this in sort of real time in a sort of spatial temporal you know location and uh, unless you've uh, pre-programmed all of this ahead of time it's unclear whether the um, a robot would have the ability to uh, organize all of the subroutines for this larger teleological purpose of making coffee now, some people think it can be done, you just need really, really good programming um, or a really good neural net that can learn from all of these things independently. So now I wanna talk about uh, the mind here from an evolutionary standpoint. And I think this is what's been missing in a lot of cognitive science is a lot of people are talking about the mind from the point of view of an adult uh, who plays chess. And this is perhaps not the best way to think about what the mind is. Because if uh, we think more carefully about the mind, we realize that it is the product of Darwinian natural selection. It evolved. And if we look at other kinds of minds, the kind of minds we might find in animals, we might be in a better place to build up something like a computational mind that really is successful with general intelligence. So I want to give you a quick sketch of a of a sort of a, a story that um, originally gets told by D philosopher Daniel Dennett in his book, Kinds of Minds. And it's a fun little um, way of thinking about the mind as having levels or layers. And he calls this the tower of generate and test. And it's worth going through this a little bit. Um, here's a couple of images just 
really more fun than anything else. On the right-hand side, you see this uh, film, Ex Machina, which has raised a lot of wonderful questions about what would it take for um, computational sophistication to arise something like self-consciousness, such that that creature would have its own self-interest, such that that creature would be able to fight for its own self-interest against the interest or competing interests of other organisms. And that is clearly involved in the film. There's also a playful inner, you know, formulation of the Turing test. Um, there's a question about emotions. All of that stuff is in play in many great science fiction films like Blade Runner and Ex Machina. And, um, but here too on the left, I, I want us to think not just about um, computation, but also I want us to think about uh, the brains. And what is it, what kind of brain power do different organisms have? Do mammals have a certain kind of brain power and capacity? How is that different from other vertebrates and insects and so on? So let's take a look at this first layer. And this would be the bottom layer of the mind. You and I and uh, other animals are Darwinian creatures. And what I love about this, about this sort of imagery is, let's look at this as a schematic sort of portrayal of how organisms meet their environment. So if you look, uh, there's three different sort of images here replicated on this slide. And what I want you to see is that on the top image, you've got this kind of weird bubble-like, you know, environment, which is coming at the, the organisms. And the organisms are coming at the environment. And each of these little blobs is sending out a kind of uh, different hardwired behavioral response to the environment. So you can think about these as, you know, insects or something. And um, each insect has a behavioral response. So when it gets really, um, let's say the environment gets really cold, one insect will engage in some kind of thermal regulation uh, to keep itself warm enough to operate. Another insect will basically dance around, you know, um, or, or will shut down and stop moving. Another insect will uh, look for a mate. And another insect will, um, will basically, uh, oh, I don't know, um, flip over on its back. It really doesn't matter. The point is that all insects are trying behavioral responses to their environment, and some of them will work and some of them will fail. Failures in this, at this Darwinian level are basically the creatures that get eliminated. So if you do the wrong thing or if you try something and it doesn't work, you get killed by the environment and you cannot then procreate and pass on your genes and therefore you cannot procreate and pass on that behavioral response. Let's say that, um, oh, I, I don't know, again, I'm sort of improvising examples here, but let's say moving around quickly is what allows you to increase your uh, internal heat or exposing yourself to the sun, let's say, and so therefore, even though the environment gets really cold, you're able to survive. So then that behavioral response is going to be selected for, and in the next generation, and in the next generation, you're going to find more of those insects which will engage in that behavior because it responds adaptively to its environment. So what happens at this level of Darwinian creatures is you try something, and if it fails, you're dead. Uh, you, but if you try something and it works, you can procreate that attempt, that behavioral attempt, to the next generation. So what happens then is that organisms over generations get smarter. They get better at solving the problems of the environment. And that is a kind of very low level mind, which we share with all other organisms. We share this, well, certainly with insects. We share it with vertebrates. We share it with mammals. And you and I are also, um, we are Darwinian creatures. Okay, now um, imagine uh, we've, we're building this tower of generated and tests. So the Darwinian creatures are on the bottom uh, level or layer of this tower. And then the next level up, built on top of that layer, is um, what um, Dennett calls Skinnerian creatures. And this is basically that layer of mind that we were talking about earlier, which um, B.F. Skinner 
isolated and described, which is the ability of the organism to learn through conditioning. And what happens in this case is if we look at the same chart, it's a wonderful contrast with the Darwinian creature. So you see the environment closing in. But you see here in this image that this is one organism try meeting the environment with um, different options. And instead of like each sort of behavioral option being forwarded by a single insect, you know, and then being eliminated or being preserved, in this case, you've got one organism trying with a sort of palette of attempts, uh, behavior, behaviors that it can try. So in this case, you've got the different behaviors represented, you know, again, one behavior might be to run away, and that's represented by the, the oval shape. One behavior might be to stay in a fight, and that, rep that behavior is represented by the little rectangle. One might be to flip on your back and show your belly. Maybe that behavior is, you know, the triangle. You get the point. What's different here is, um, at this level of mind, what happens is the environment chooses uh, for a certain behavior. Let's say the behavior that works well is running away. And if you don't run away, you get all beat up and bruised and, and bloodied, you know, by some kind of fight with uh, another competitor or something else, a, a, or a predator in the environment. So what happens is for the Skinnerian creature, like you and I, or like your dog or cat, or, or really like most other uh, mammals, you can basically learn through experience. And now the next time you encounter that foe in the environment, you don't try out the five different options or just take a stab at it. You've got a much better option. So you can make a smarter res behavioral response to the environment. In this case, it's running away. This is, if you think about the entire animal kingdom, this is a very successful strategy for problem solving and responding to the environment in real time. And you can see why it would be selected for in the kind of organisms that could learn through experience. So if you're able to be conditioned, like, like all mammals can, you can see that you suddenly become much smarter than the insects we were talking about earlier. It's still a Darwinian world for you, but you've got equipment and capacities that the insects lack. Now we go up the next level of the tower of generate and test, and we've got uh, a layer built on top of the Skinnerians. And these Dennett calls Popperian creatures. I don't particularly care for this kind of way of describing them. I don't think it's important for our purposes. The point of it is this, however. If you look at the chart, you can see here comes the environment. And now this is you and I. This is the kind of creature that can not only offer alternative behavioral, behavioral possibilities and learn through conditioning, but we can actually represent ourselves and the environment. We can imagine what it's like to face some giant creature with huge teeth and claws, and we can run through behavioral options in our imagination or in our mind's eye, and we can sort of, using experience and a little bit of you know predictive ability, predictive processing, we can sort of decide which one's gonna be best. And this is sort of a remarkable achievement because now what you're doing is you're taking your responses and your uh, predictions about the world offline and you're able to run them in these little virtual movies inside your head so that you can see or at least do experiments in these virtual movie examples to see which behavioral options are going to be more successful and which ones are going to be failures. It's not foolproof, these are just serviceable systems, but nonetheless this gives us a tremendous advantage. I don't have to wait to get to feel the pain of learning through conditioning. You know, I don't have to wait to feel the pleasures through conditioning. I can actually run these little virtual reality programs, which means I'm able to represent uh, the world and nature and myself uh, to myself in the mind. And that is a level of mind that many other animals do not possess. There's some argue, argument about which animals have this and which ones don't. Um, it's pretty clear. Obviously, humans can do this. Uh, obviously, well, maybe not. Maybe nothing else is obvious, but arguably, 
uh, dogs and cats and many other mammals can do some of this representation. But some people think, no, they're just responding in a conditioned way. Um, there's a wonderful experiment they, they're able to do with a dog that strikes me as compelling along these lines. If you take a dog and you, um, you, you build a model of, and they've done this in, in um, experimental labs, uh, you, you have a room next door that the dog has never been in, and you have the, the dog's favorite chew toy, which it loves. Now you make a model to scale of that room next door and you bring it in and introduce it to the dog, you show it to the dog, and then you, you show a little scale model of its favorite toy. So it recognizes this smaller version of its favorite toy, and then you hide it in like the cushion of a chair in this model. It's kind of a remarkable thought experiment. It's not a thought experiment, it's a real experiment. But the fact that they cooked this up just uh, impresses me. So you, you show the animal that you're hiding something it likes in a small version um, in this couch or cushion. And then um, you take the dog into this room that it's never been in before. And it's able to basically use the visual symbolic model that it's just seen to read the actual room and find the toy that um, it wants to play with. Now, there's all kinds of objections, I think, and all kinds of things have to be controlled. For example, is the animal using, recognizing this as a symbol of its toy, or does it just see it as another object that it's not of the same type at all? And when it gets in the room, is it just using its massive powers of smell <laughs> to detect the thing? And for us, it looks like it's, it's sort of mapping, you know, a one-to-one -one uh, relationship of model to actual space when in fact all it's doing is using its smell to find the object. You've got to control for all that. But it looks like they've been able to do that and it looks like then what animals like our dogs and cats are doing is they've got pretty sophisticated um, sort of visual and other perceptual models of the world that they can use to then reason with and problem solve even though they're also very sophisticated at conditioning. In any case, human beings can replicate um, explicitly uh, the natural world inside their own minds and then run these experiments. So you've, we started with the Darwinian creatures, which have to try and die. Then we had the Skinnerians, who can try options and learn from experience. And now we've got a layer on top of that, which is you're able to run these virtual reality representations in your head and essentially or rehearse them in the body through simulations, and then you've got a whole new level of intelligence or mind. Now we've got one more layer on top of this, which would be something like, um, Dennett calls these Gregorian creatures, and for our purposes, all you have to do is think that the next level up is the kind of animal that is good at, symbols, uh, at using symbols um, and tools. And now you're not just running a movie in your head, but you've got a whole way of sort of using tools to improve your chances of survival. And so for us, uh, the environment then is filled with smart problem solving abilities like hammers, uh, books, language is a symbol system that we can then use to represent reality to ourselves and to others because it gives us a very sophisticated way for me to recreate what I'm thinking about in your mind. And so language is a great system by which I can read your mind and I can also give you something in my mind. You know, basically this can be problem solving techniques for how to get from here to there, but also I can convey to you emotions, I can read your emotions, and these are all part of the sort of symbol systems we have. I mean, other stuff is happening in terms of emotions too, which is that we're able to read each other's body language. But we're also able to use language and tools. And this basically is a quantum leap in intelligence. Because even though there are cases of animals using tools, the level of sophistication is still quite low. Uh, chimps will use reeds and sticks to pull out termites. And we know that even birds, 
are very uh, smart in terms of using objects to sort of get at food that they otherwise could not get at. And that requires a, what looks like a kind of reasoning about the environment. Now, there's some reason to think that this is not symbolic reasoning, but what uh, psychologists will sometimes call the ability to manipulate affordances. Animals can read objects as being, as having potential. So you look at my glasses, and you could think about my glasses as basically a way to see things better. I can see the text I'm trying to read better. But also, objects like this have affordances. They afford the user all kinds of other functions, not just being able to read um, words better. So animals can look at or, or interact with an object like this, and while they may not know anything about reading, they could see that it could be pushed across a surface and it could actually be used, it could be knocked off a surface, and therefore it could hit into the water, and, and maybe you could get water this way. It, it's able to see this as have, affording other behaviors, even though it's not symbolically reasoning about the glasses. Um, we have a sense, too, that from growing up with objects, we can sort of manipulate them and not really understand them in a sort of theoretical way. Like, I know that with this, I suppose if somebody attacked me, I could try to poke them in the eye with it. That's a pretty weird use of this object, and yet it would be an adaptive use of the object in a fight scenario. How do I know that? Well, it's kind of an embodied cognition. It's a way of understanding objects to know that, well, this guy's kind of a sharp edge on it, and it's stiff enough that it could do some damage. I can't get it through your through your chest, so I can't stab you to death with it. I don't know why my examples are so violent, <laughs> but, uh, but you see what I'm saying, you're able to read this as an affordance. When your cat comes in the room, your cat is not looking at the chair and thinking, well, there's a chair, and chairs are the kinds of things I can sit on because I learned what a chair was in school. No, your cat just sees the world as made up of thing, things you can sit on, things you can hide under, things you can jump on, uh, so chairs for cats are sit, sitable objects. Um, tables are hide underables. Uh, these are the affordances, and this is the way in which animals uh, sort of uh, are able to sort of intelligently solve these embodied problems in the environment. But you and I have another layer on top, which is conceptual, and we're able to sort of think about a chair as being a type of thing, and that all these different individual chairs are all conceptually unified under the umbrella of chair, chairness. So, all right. Um, so then that gives us a general sense of how to think about minds as being really not all or nothing. It's not like I have a mind and the dog doesn't, or I have a mind and the oyster doesn't. There must be all these layers of mind and intelligence. So if we're going to talk about artificial intelligence, we need to understand well, what kind of mind are we trying to achieve here or attain? And that is um, something that's very crucial and needs to be uh, attended to, I think, more carefully as AI goes forward. All right, let's look then at some of the techniques of AI in particular. Um, as I said, early forms of AI were trying to model the environment, so robotics we're trying to build a visual system and a mainframe, and this turned out to be impossible because it was so complicated to, to teach a robot how to get out of a room by trying to model the room for it, that it was, it was computationally um, overwhelming. Instead, what happened was um, AI and robotics started to think a little bit more about the way in which, um, you know, uh, uh, insects solve problems. Uh, you just throw a whole bunch of options at the problem and the ones that successfully uh, achieve a solution are retained for the next generation and the rest are eliminated. So you do multiple generations. And what this creates is a kind of machine learning that we call neural nets. And in the same way that I was describing those Darwinian creatures where the insect tries a behavioral option and it fails, then it gets eliminated. So too, what we were able to do with neural nets is, with digital systems, we were able to try different informational pathways. And so we have an input layer, 
and then we have a series of gates of on and, on and off, binary pathways, and some of them will basically dead end or be eliminated because they don't produce the response we want. But some of them will successfully um, emerge at the other end of the output layer and produce the behavior we want. So per, uh, sort of a simple example of this is, let's say you, um, I don't know, what's an example of this? You want, uh, you know, you, you, you create a, a pressure on the system, which is you want um, the AI to learn how to get out of the room. And you basically create, you know, a series of robots uh, with little simple transduction transducers that can read the light in the room and basically can uh, have sort of very simple programming where the program is sort of move forward um, unless you hit a wall, in which case turn right. Very simple kind of programming. Now, um, you set all these to work and you find that basically um, some of these little AI robots are able to get out of the room and some of them are not. And you basically have to think of this now as being replicated inside a kind of um, digital space. And so you create sort of a software where you're trying to get like the, you know, an image to move across the screen. And you try uh, various uh, sort of algorithmic processing. And the result is that nine out of 10 attempts that doesn't move the image across the screen, but one of them does. So you take that and you replicate it. Now, um, there's a whole lot of layers here, which I, I, I am neither uh, you know, smart enough to articulate. And we'd have to do some, uh, nor do I think for the purposes of this discussion, are, should we be going there? But suffice it to say, what you're doing is you're creating, um, by using Boolean algebra, you're using uh, functors like and, or, if, then, and then you're using variables. And you're plugging your variables into these systems of functors, and then you're basically looking for outputs. So uh, what you're doing in, in this kind of algorithm, algorithmic processing is that you're assigning some kind of on or off or true or false value to the variables, and then when you enter them all together into the system, you get a kind of output. This is how early sort of programming was devised, and the result are these very complex, deep neural network uh, systems. Now, what's sort of fascinating about these is the early phases were such that we could figure out how machine learning was working and how it was solving the problem because we could track it. But very quickly, the computational complexity got so great that we couldn't track what was happening exactly. All we could see was the input and the output layer. And in many ways, what was happening was we were devising uh, bots or algorithmic programs to essentially propose options and to also act like a natural selection editing system to select which systems were working given the parameter uh, assigned teleological goal that we wanted. So, you know, in a case, let's, let's think of a sort of a simple example of this. Um, I, uh, here's something we are interacting with all the time. Like, let's say I like to Google guitars and look at guitar, guitar porn. Here's a Telecaster, here's a Stratocaster. And so I'll look at stuff online of guitars. Now, let's say there's a simple algorithm, which is uh, Google basically wants to sell me, well, the guitar makers hire Google so they can make advertisements which sell me a guitar. What happens is um, the program will just throw images at me. And let's say the ultimate goal is to measure how long Steve is is looking at guitars. And um, that's the ultimate goal state. That's the output layer. The, I mean, obviously the, the ultimate goal is for me to then go out and buy a guitar. But th as far as the AI knows, the goal is for me to stay on the guitar image longer or interact with the guitar image longer. Now, the AI uh, designers will sort of have 
um, options that they put into the system, like, well, let's show him images of guitar and text and, and, and uh, people playing guitar and um, different kind of wording and fonts and other variables. And all it does is it knows what the ultimate goal is, and then it throws all of these options at me until eventually it is able to correlate that um, Steve is online longer looking at guitars when X, Y, and Z variables are, uh, are occurring with the guitars. So it doesn't know what's working or why it's working. It just notices that variable X, Y, and Z have my eyeballs on the guitars longer than any of the other variables. So now what does it do? It starts replicating those variables. So I don't know what it would be exactly. Let's say like, St you know, Steve looks at guitars more when there's a scantily clad woman holding the guitar or something like this. Now, it doesn't know about scantily clad women. And um, I'm not even maybe consciously making this decision, but it's correlating the time I've spent on screen with the Stratocaster and all of the variables that it's been throwing. And it's basically saying this one is working. Eliminate the others and replicate scantily clad women. Now, it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't know what scantily clad women are and it doesn't know about my preferences. All it's doing is ma matching these things. Now, imagine that that's happening at layers and layers of complexity that we can't even track anymore. And the result is that the designers of these neural networks don't even know why certain kinds of variables are working rather than others. Um, the AI is smarter in that sense, even though it's a kind of zombie intelligence. It doesn't know anything about the meaning of these variables. All it's doing is mapping associational correlations. So what you've got now is an adaptation and evolution directed and undirected. Early programming was, well, we're directing the computer to solve these problems. Now we have bots selecting bots, and this is a kind of undirected adaptation or evolution. So machines are getting smarter, they're getting better at solving problems, but in many ways, we're no longer the ones feeding all of the variable options, nor are we able to track the, the correlations that are happening in the deep structures of the neural networks we're just seeing the consequences of this in terms of whether or not the goal states are being achieved or not. So that's kind of a remarkable state of computation that's happening now that wasn't happening, say, 10 years ago. This idea of bots selecting bots and that we can't even really track what, why certain things are working and why other things are not. And this is why you'll see Oftentimes you hear the talk now of big data computation. And so what's happening is that we're collecting all this data and you know there's a concern that there's all this data on me and there's all this data on you. But really big data is just collecting correlations of every kind. And most of this big data is what they call dark data. It's unstructured. It does not, it's not useful because no one knows how to use it. Um, and no one knows how to set up, uh, how to connect it to achievable goals and how to achieve, you know, the ends we want through these means. But um, in some cases, we are able to use and structure this data to achieve goals and ends that we want. But sometimes we don't even know how that's working, and that's su surprising. So we're using this, obviously, in marketing, we're using it even in the humanities, we're using it in medicine. We're able to throw all this data in to uh, some of the medical AI and they're able to find correlations with, let's say, certain kinds of cancer or certain kinds of diabetes that correlate to things that we would have never made a correlation to. Uh, and so th this is, I'm just speculating here because I'm improvising an example. But they are able to say, well, okay, these, pers these people have certain kinds of, let's say, blood cancers. And strangely, it seems correlated with, uh, I don't know, a lack of, of a sense of smell in your teen years. Totally random, doesn't seem to be connected at all. And yet, uh, AI is able to compute so much of this that it's able to find some correlation. Now, we don't know what the causal relationship is between these. 
And in many cases, we don't even know how the computer found these correlations because we're just dumping, you know, inputs. Um, and uh, so that's what's sort of remarkable is that there is a kind of intelligent, adaptive, uh, even a kind of evolution of problem solving that's happening. But in some ways, the instigators of it, us human beings, don't know um, how it's happening in the deep neural nets. And um, the neural nets themselves don't know because they are unconscious and don't know the meaning of any of these correlations themselves, nor the meaning of the purposes. It, that's the kind of zombie intelligence that I'm talking about. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the, some of the general problems for artificial intelligence. Here's some stuff that doesn't get, some of this gets discussed and some of it just gets ignored. But let's look at this list here on the left-hand side. One issue that gets nowhere near enough attention but seems to me to be fundamental is uh, that um, there are these things called cognitive drives. And these are animal motivation or directionality. This is, uh, cognitive drive refers to a Latin word conatus, which means striving. And so one way to think about this is that all animals, all creatures that are intelligent that we know of, have a deep animal drive to survive. And it feels like something to want to strive to survive. It's not some abstract computational inference, it really, the, the, the will to survive is sort of like a feeling state and an ultimate goal or form of seeking uh, or foraging that all mammals have and we, we really think all vertebrates have the cognitive drive. Now we actually know from affective or emotional neuroscience that what, what is the the sort of architecture of that drive or the neurochemistry, and it, it's very much involved in um, the dopamine system. So what happens in vertebrates is that when they're ser searching for food or mates or just getting out into the environment and looking for resources, they their dopamine system is rising and rising. You've got all these neurochemicals in the brain. Dopamine is a, f is a neurotransmitter that's correlated with anticipation and searching and pursuing, and all animals have this. Now, in many ways, AI has forgotten this entirely and has not worried about this, trying to replicate this drive in, in terms of artificial intelligence. And I think that that is a huge mistake. Um, you're never gonna get anything like a biological mind without understanding this foundational drive for problem solving, whether it's, again, the pursuit of food or a sexual partner, but also you can feel this in curiosity itself and some of our higher level thinking. Like when you're just trying to figure out the solution and you're pursuing something online you're, and you're trying to f understand it, uh, also the dopamine system is rising and rising and you're driven to kind of close a loop. And these drives are driven primarily by what biologists call homeostasis. So what's happening is a kind of imbalance is happening in the, that's either in the neurotransmitters or at the hormonal level, or it could be, you know, about homeostasis in terms of salts and, and potassiums in the blood and the cell and sort of crossing the cell uh, barriers. What happens is the system is getting out of whack and out of homeostasis, and then it needs some kind of resolution to restore to homeostasis. So in the case of the cognitive drives or conatus, the animal basically gets to achieve the reward that it's pursuing and then that restabilizes the system. It's like scratching a, an itch that you have. And so the mind is motivated deeply by these, these, for lack of a better word, these itches that the mind needs to scratch. And unless we sort of uh, build this in, the AI systems are never going to be able to do this. And we don't even know how to go about this in terms of artificial intelligence. This seems to be purely biological causation. It happens by a different system than digital, and so we don't know how to build that into AI. The emotions. Uh, obviously, we would like to have AI that's emotional, 
and we don't know how to do that. Uh, there are many emotional systems in the mind, fear, um, anger, lust, or love, and we, these again are biological um, uh, neurochemical systems for which we can train AI to recognize, like we can train AI to recognize your face when it's mad or angry, but it's not solving problems, nor is it motivated by anger or feeling states because it doesn't feel anything. AI does not have subjective feeling states that are requisite for emotions. It doesn't have pain and uh, pleasure. And so the emotional systems are built out of these basic ingredients. So for that reason, AI is way far away from the human mind. Um, AI does not have imagination. Uh, it is not able to improvise and meet problems in the way that human beings can through imaginative work. Uh, obviously, as I just said, it doesn't have sentience in the sense of you and I and every other vertebrate has, and invertebrates too in some cases, have nervous systems. So we're able to move towards things that feel good and move away from things that feel bad. Mind is built in layers on top of that sentient system and AI does not have that system. It can, it can um, replicate that system and have a kind of mock system, but it is not motivated by feeling states. AI does not have self-consciousness at this point, nor do we see how, how that can be achieved. We don't even understand self-consciousness in human beings either, so it's very hard to see how to program that. And finally, um, you and I and all other animals have these wet biological processes in which the brain operates according to these topographical relations in the, in the, in the brain volumetric relations, homeostasis, the way in which the, the, you know, the, the synapses are not just electrical systems that we can replicate in binary digital systems, but they're also chemical systems. They are electrochemical systems. And it's the chemical part that's sort of missing in some of these AI um, research programs. And you know, the way to maybe characterize that issue, this, the, the issue of sentience and consciousness, is to talk about the easy problem and the hard problem of consciousness. It's one thing for us to sort of be able to read the light in the room and move towards objects. That's a good way in which uh, our minds work, but we think AI can solve those problems. The hard problem is, what is it like to, to see color and to feel pain and to be me? Those things, uh, you can't really, it's, arguably it's very hard to replicate that in just a purely physical system, or at least it's unclear to us how we would replicate it. All right, what are the dangers of AI? There's a combination of dangers. One is um, the AI breakout problem. And this is the idea of a fast adapting and evolving virus. It's possible that we'll make an AI that's just set up to do a simple problem. Um, like, I think it was Nick Bostrom, uh, the philosopher, who said, well, what if you just made an AI and its sole job was to make the best paper clips possible? Um, which is funny because it's so dumb. But he says, look, if you said, no matter what, make the best uh, paper clips possible, it is within the, you know, the bounds of, of reasonable <laughs> that this thing could uh, assess the situation and say, well, I could make much better paper clips if I could basically move from these mainframes and these laptop computers and these industrial computers at this plant in Des Moines, Iowa to move all around the country. So you can imagine like a virus, this program could move easily through Wi-Fi, through phone, through, you know, through laser op fiber optics, could move to other systems all around um, the country and all around the world and basically take over computer systems and basically disable them or shut them down so that it can continue its main task, which is to make much better paper clips. Now that seems silly and yet vi um, AI viruses can behave in ways like this. Now imagine the next step, which is the AI uh, makes a calculation, and this is not an intellectual inferential system, it just says, 
well, there's competing resources uh, systems over here. If I shut down those resource systems, I can take those resources to build better paper clips. So let's say it shuts down the, the, the military, <laughs> and then it shuts down the food farming agricultural agribusiness system so that it can keep now can make all paper clips using those systems. And then it just basically figures out, well, these human beings are just in the way. I can make better paper clips if we just get rid of them. You see where this is going. It's not that the AI has achieved self-consciousness and wants to take over the world. It's just in a zombie-like way attempting to achieve its prime motive, its prime program. And it does so at the cost of everything else, including you and I. So that's one problem you know, that we, we could call the breakout problem. The other problem is that uh, unconscious hyper-efficiency that diminishes humanity or ecology. And I guess this is sort of just another way of saying that the breakout problem. It could be that um, you know, aspects of the environment and aspects that are unquantifiable and that are not efficient, but we consider them to be very human and meaningful, will be degraded by thinking of mind entirely as just efficient problem solving. So you can see, you know, there's a kind of utilitarian expediency here that might start to take over all of our systems if we don't build in some kind of fail safes here. Uh, and then thirdly is the one that's probably more familiar to us because of pop culture worries, but it's probably the least likely worry or danger of, of AI because we're just so far away from this. But it's the idea that conscious AI uh, evolves its own self-interest and takes over knowing that it's in competition with you and I and other organisms. And this is the kind of Skynet makes, you know, the Terminator, you know, or Blade Runners become conscious and start wiping out human beings, or it's the Westworld, you know, phenomenon where stuff that was built for our pleasure or to create efficient problem solving now becomes autonomous. So, here the idea is that um, AI may be built for as a kind of s slave culture that is not aware or conscious and we use them. But imagine if they did become complex enough that consciousness emerged within them, like it did presumably in um, biological formats, then they would suddenly be aware of their own interests as being different from what their, their overlords want from them, and in which case they would start to evolve their own self-interest. Now, again, we're, we're so far away from this because, as I was suggesting in the last slide, one of the things you need is not just like a light going on inside all this computational machinery, but you also need something like conatus or a cognitive drive, which is the drive to, to survive. And as far as we know, that only exists in animals that are biological, that have nervous systems, that have pleasure and pain. And so you need a sentient system before you ever had self-awareness and self-interests. Um, and then the last thing I'll say on this, uh, and then we'll close out because it's a, it's a big topic and we can go on, but this is sort of a nice place to end. One way to think about AI is not as a standalone intelligence, but just a way to augment or en enhance human intelligence. And here one thinks about two examples. One, I think famously, Ray Kurzweil and many others, but probably Kurzweil is the sort of granddaddy of this thinking, of the singularity and post-humanism. Um, here the idea is that we'll be able to augment our own bodies and our minds using robotics for the body, but also using artificial intelligence for our minds. And instead of just having, you know, AI glasses that can read the environment. And we're, we've got this now where you can walk down the street and AI can, can block certain things in your field of vision, can raise up information about what you're seeing. Eventually, we'll probably have to see ads appearing in these glasses. Now imagine you can build this into the eye itself and, and connect the eyes to the internet and Google so that instead of having Google Maps, you know, in your phone, it'll actually be written, you know, in your field of vision through some kind of retinal wiring. 
This kind of stuff is in play. And what Kurzweil says is we're fast approaching the singularity where we merge with um, computational sophistication such that our minds quantum leap forward and we have all the access to that deep, uh, uh, that sort of uh, big data that I was talking about before. And that is sort of one of these ways in which AI and biological intelligence could merge together. And that's happening. And there's a wide variety of idealisms and you know utopian um, forms of uh, theorizing this. And Kurzweil is utopian in his approach. Others are more um, dystopian about this and worry, as do I, about ways in which uh, you know people could have access to your mind uh, if you're giving you know your you know access to uh, other computers and mainframes uh, then you you might actually be giving uh, access into your own mind to to um, nefarious uh, agents um, or bad actors um, another group that's working on this of course is elon musk is working on um, uh, he has a small company that he runs called Neuralink, and they're basically jacking into the brain um, using chips and these very thin filaments. And they're basically creating a kind of read and write chip that will be posted in on the head, but it'll have filaments into the brain. It will read sort of action potential spikes in the brain, and it will correlate those with ways in which the body moves. And the original way of using this is, let's say somebody is paralyzed or has uh, a terrible accident uh, as, a, as a veteran and can't operate their arm or they lose the arm. The idea is that you could um, bypass the injured parts and you could take the executive functions of the brain where you want to move your arm. You could patch those into the motor areas of the brain that operate a robotic arm and now you could just think about moving your arm and move this robotic arm in much the way that I am now just ordinarily via organic causation thinking about moving my arm and moving my arm. That's remarkable and that's going to be very helpful to people who've had injuries. But now think about it. It's also going to be able to read and write in regular brains. And when you think, I don't know, let's imagine you, you want to you've got to study all night so you don't want to get tired so the the neural link knows what's happening when the sleepy brain is happening and it knows what's happening when the the sort of stimulated brain is happening and so you just take your phone out and you basically just reprogram your brain so that for the next eight hours instead of sleeping you're going to be as if you've had like five cups of coffee and so you're going to be able to technologically get in and adjust neurotransmitter activity in ways that we've never been able to do before. And that's both exciting and vaguely frightening. Um, you know, let's say you want to get high, you're able to release the internal endogenous opioids um, within your system. And basically, well, you set your phone to, to getting stoned for a few hours and then you come down, you're going to be able to basically get into your brain in, this, in ways that are remarkable. And you're also going to be able to access information in, in remarkable ways. So this is a way in which we're not building freestanding AI, but collaborating with AI and with human intelligence. Now, the reason why this is exciting but also disturbing is that uh, I don't think we're anywhere near uh, achieving standalone AI because it has no cognitive or motivational powers like I was talking about earlier but you do, and other animals do. And if a, a problem-solving computational AI could harvest your cognitive drive or motivational drive, your, your ability to go out and seek in the world and have a kind of lust for life or striving, a will to live, then you've got something that's kind of disturbing, which is you could have something that... Um, is has cognitive abilities and thought processes at uh, that are that need a motivating um, power to move it through the world to achieve those ends 
and it could harvest yours <laughs> or it could harvest the motivational abilities of an animal and basically get the animal to do its bidding. Now, this is obviously science fictional, sort of, I'm just sort of running a thought experiment here, but the, our mind is, does come in these layers, as it were. It's interwoven and interpenetrated in ways that may be inextricable, but it's also pretty clear that sort of motor areas of the brain and affective areas of the brain um, are lower in the brain stem and in the limbic system. And it's possible that we, we might be able to detach these and then rebuild them in ways that are um, frightening and disturbing. So that's something to think about too in terms of enhancement and augmentation.